show. Yeah, we can do that. We'll do it over the weekend. How's that? Yeah. Okay, I'll give you a show. <clears throat> and the dynamic, uh, Tim Alexander is here with some horrifying news about the state of the world, and it is not good. Since we last visited last Thursday, things have gone further down the maw of the open volcano called World Geopolitics. Uh, Tim, tell us what's happening. Well, and uh, this, some of these stories are so over the top. It's like it's like Saturday Night Live from Seven, from, from Saturday Night Live from Hell. It is <laughs> that we're we're looking at uh, things that seem so impossible that if you presented this as a script to a Hollywood movie producer, they'd say, "I don't like the script that much because it's not believable." But whatever you were on when you wrote the script, I want some. <laughs> That's how nuts this is. This is so nuts. It's like it's not believable, even to someone who quote, is well, a conspiracy you know, theorist. Uh, the the Turkey, the prime minister, is <laughs> rolling mad. Uh, he steam's coming out of his ears. He has not only the other day banned Twitter, but now he's banned YouTube because um, they're all their top people, uh, foreign minister, defense minister, head of security, and so forth were caught talking, and they, this was leaked and, and published on YouTube, uh, in a security meeting uh, about creating a false flag attack on Turkey uh, from Syrian soil to use as an excuse to launch a war against Syria. And Whoa. they have admitted now, uh, I, I didn't get the update, uh, uh, this isn't on my blog yet, but... Uh, uh, Zero Hedge has an interesting article that uh, says that the, the Turkish political and military leaders have admitted to planning a false flag terror attack to justify a war with Syria. Now, of course, Syria, big brother, is Russia, and China and, also and, is very much... And, uh, and Iran, and by the way, the Iranian Shahib 3 missile can strike any city in Europe, including most of the cities in Turkey, and their drones, which can fly under radar from Iran, can take out almost any place. Plus, the S-300, which the Syrians already have, will knock out anything the size of a bird or larger. If the Russians feel a real threat, not only do they have the Akan hypersonic cruise missile, but the Hoot super cavitation torpedoes and much more. Oh, yeah. uh, this is going to get very nasty. In other words, our Navy, the Turkish Navy, Air Force, whatever, that tries to go into Syrian airspace, they're going to go down. And the Syrians need to realize the largest depot of chemical and fuel air bombs in the world is in Syria. Yeah. You know? And that, by the way, is where the Gerald Bull super gun went from Iraq and went to Syria. So yeah, and, all and, of this... You know, uh, Gerald Bull was a genius, but uh, the Mossad killed him. But what they have done in the Middle East, uh, they were, they, there were attempts made to buy extreme high-pressure steel that they need to create these giant cannons that can literally launch something into outer space. And um, so several countries, including Saddam Hussein, uh, they tried to buy the steel, and, and it was stopped. But then someone figured out a way to do it using steel that's not quite so hard. And that is they use as tough a steel as they can get, a very large tube, launch tube, and they wrap it with very hot steel, um, you know, the steel cabling that you use on bridges and girders and so forth. And they wrap it several times in different directions, kind of like you make plywood, you know. Uh, it runs one direction and the other, and it makes it very, very hard. And, of course, as it cools, it, it, it tightens up very tightly. And then the, the breach is the key part, but they're able to load projectiles in that can literally go. Now, if you're firing in a region, like it's an intermediate ballistic, uh, intermediate range ballistic missile, uh, you don't really have to fully launch it into space, but you go to the edge of space and you can do a thousand or fifteen hundred nautical mile range, or if you go, Fully orbital, you can launch it anywhere on Earth. And right, and you can actually strike anywhere on Earth. Piece. Plus, what it does, it doesn't have to carry a payload of fuel, so it can have multiply targeted warheads. They can strike anywhere on the planet. And by the way, these come in so fast, you can't stop them. That's yeah. why they want to hit the Russian missiles on their launch phase, because even without the evasive technology of the Topol M new version of the missile, if Iran decides or Syria decides to launch missiles with the Gerald Bull cannon, there's nothing we can do to stop them from nuking any U.S. city 
or hitting us with a biological well, or fuel air bomb. They have nukes, but uh, <laughs> they certainly could. They don't need to have them. They didn't have cobalt-60 just as easy exactly. to get. Exactly. That's a, a radiological bomb. And right. so you get the fallout of a nuke without the, the atomic explosion. Of right. course, you can do fuel air uh, submunitions and blanket an area and take out, uh, say, uh, uh, a yeah. city or part of a city uh, and turn everything into dust without using nuclear material. They found out, for example, if you had a distributed bomb that has a number of mini warheads and you spray them over a large city like Los Angeles, you can literally have the same effect as a nuke without a nuclear bomb. Exactly. So a large I, number of small I micro. I gave that information to one of Israel's top generals uh, years ago over lunch, mm -hmm. and I literally scared the hell out of him. Well, um, what you need to understand is if they start a war with Syria, there's two people on earth that have never been defeated, Syrians and Russians. And if they attack Syria, it's the end of the West. If they attack Iran, it's the end of the West. Well, if they attack the, Russia the, and China... It's also connected to the Ukraine because right. Russia, it's felt, is kind of tied down in the Ukraine. But I'll tell you what, uh, after seeing what's happened, uh, I was convinced Putin was going to go into the eastern Ukraine. He may, but no, Putin is being very, very shrewd. No, no, no. He's he not have to do anything. doing what they expect him to do. I suspect what we will see in the Ukraine is what I call a battle <laughs> of the commandos, a battle of the, the black forces. Well, and I think the next thing prepared to do that than Russia because she's right next door, and they have a lot of native Ukrainian speakers, and they're already there. And yes, we can send Blackwater or whatever they're calling themselves uh, this month. We can send them in several hundred of the, the these murderers and several hundred other murderers. But the Russians have some very tough people too, and they're right next door, and they can play the game better. And then when things get bad enough. Uh, uh, Putin can just roll on right in. We we just passed a yeah. uh, uh, the the IMF, you know, is is prepared to loan them billions of dollars. Well, you know, that's like saying uh, walk yeah. in and I've got a 357 <laughs> that's loaded and I'll give you something that will solve all your problems. Bang, yeah. you know. Yeah. So the yeah, rape and pillage of the uh, of the people the same as Greece, Spain, Italy, like you have in your article. Exactly. exactly. And then also, I want you to get into the story about Yulia Timoshenko, this devil <laughs> with his halo hair wrapped around her head, and her comments recently in the media. This is sickening. That she wants to nuke millions of Ukrainians. She said she wants to get rid of the MFers. I mean, this is actually her own words. How crazy! And she's a a criminal who got popped out of prison early by these criminals that took over the government by a coup in, in Kiev. Well, and she's an oligarch. Her... She, she used her position as prime minister twice to steal billions of dollars. And, right. and yeah, she was caught, uh, what was this, two, three days ago it came out. Uh, they leaked a recording, uh, and she's, you know, they, they, she was asked, well, what do we do with all the Russians in the eastern Ukraine? She says, well, we kill them with nuclear weapons. I mean, well, if this I, lady I, wants to be president, you can't make this stuff up. I know. I, I, that's why I say it's so beyond. Whenever you pinch yourself in the morning, I get up and I'm thinking, okay, I got to do a show today. How do I prepare? First off, I got to prepare in prayer because it's so shocking. Even if you deal with this daily, it's like, oh my gosh, you recoil from it to say, no, 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 this didn't really happen. No, the, the IMF really didn't say this or do this, or Obama really didn't say this. And in three or four moves ahead, the Russians are already saying, okay, no problem. We're going to deploy uh, Topol M missiles in, in, in Nicaragua, in Cuba, and in, in Venezuela. Have a nice day, Mr. Obama. I call him Mr. Obama. Okay, what an idiot he is. Damn it. You, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, uh, you have, well, people that want to create the Third World War, I maintain, are legally, medically, clinically insane. Well, look at Obama. If, they think if, if he thinks if you worship him, everything is cool. If he's cool and you think he's cool, the world shall be, go on and peace shall rule the valley. And you've got a bunch of worms in your brain. He does. He's got demonic worms in his brain. He even refers in reverse speech to Barack Obama as a different personality than Barry Sotaro because he's multiple personality plus. Welcome back, uh, Tim. Um, it's interesting the Flight 370 occurred right around the time that the Israelis pulled back their uh, 
their all their if you want to call it all of their sites all over the world. Yeah, they, all, they, yeah they, they're all, all the embassies. So, so yeah. here's what I think happens. We know that the Israelis are the only ones who have full access to our intelligence information, which includes, by the way, the availability to flight Boeing 747, uh, any Boeing jet. Uh, if it were terrorists, they would have owned up to it already. If it was a, um, a strike by uh, air by debris from a satellite, a meteor, or anything else, you would see a debris field on the ground. Um, we know that the flight changed changed course. Um, <clears throat> the possibilities are that the, the flight was redirected by uh, either remotely flying the plane or there was a hijacking by one of the pilots or co-pilots. Yeah, it's and it, it also flew a little bit higher than what the 777s, triple seven normally flies. Got up to 45. It can fly at 45,000 uh, feet. Uh, but uh, you can also depressurize it. It's possible the pilot or a co-pilot killed the other one and uh, simply put it in a situation where it robbed the passengers of oxygen. The onboard emergency oxygen systems are only good for a few minutes. They're designed for rapid descent. Uh, and we have to always go to those backwards. Uh, arranged it to fly in the far Indian Ocean, and everybody died. And when it ran out of fuel, it, it, it crashed yeah, in the water. That's I don't think I, I don't think it was terrorism. I think the one thing is we know that the the manifest, the list of people on the plane were uh, quantum computer experts from China. And this is well, my, now there is a lot of speculation about this one company, and it comes uh, at the end of the day. Uh, they had uh, there was a key patent that they had, and the patent was in the names of I think five, four or five individuals or companies. And the way the patent was set up, the surviving entity uh, gets it all, and that happens to be a company that's a, a controlled by the Rothschilds. Now, does that mean they did it? Well, I blame the Rothschilds for a lot, but I don't necessarily blame them for this. Um, you know, uh, that particular technology had, uh, had to do with, with stealthing aircraft. And that's a lot of that stuff has been around for a long time, although this was something new. But, you know, uh, what I heard also is that they, uh, these patents also covered new quantum technology. So I'll tell you what, I, the pieces that I have together, key bono, number one, who's going to benefit, i.e. the Rothschilds. Number two, what technology was it? It deals with stealth aircraft and supercomputer or quantum chips. Uh, my guess is, just like everything, the Israelis are stealing everything. They're the biggest industrial espionage in the world, bigger than China, bigger than anybody. It's the Israelis. They are not our ally. Well, the, the only better. reason they're that big is we allow them carte blanche access to almost everything. Right. So here's what my thesis it's is. Just like, steal, it, it, just like the dancing. The and the computer codes to, to get in any building on Earth, and you have free access. Well, that's why, for example, the uh, company under Melvin Bush was actually managing until the 9-11, the security of the World Trade Center Tower 1 and 2 and 6. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and Melvin Bush, George Bush's brother. Shortly before the attacks, over several weekends, there were all these people in there doing wiring. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah right. And Odingo, which is the Odigo, which is basically an Israeli um, messaging company, had completely turned all their staff out of the building, so no one there died. Yeah. We know that the Israelis had the security companies who were probably putting micro-nukes. There's only four nations on Earth that could do micro-nukes. Russia, America, France, and Israel, period. The Israelis, including the bombing in Bali, India, was a micro-nuke bombing. I talked to the nuclear experts. Yeah, it, it, it was. It was. And, and, and a micro-nukes, you know, uh, when people think of nuclear weapons, they think of... Uh, the 1945 to through the early 50s and 60s, great big explosions and so forth. The technology has had billions of dollars a year spent on it by all sides. So we've advanced. I mean, we're in the fourth and fifth generation nuclear weapons, directed energy beams. Uh, if you want a, a visual example, uh, look at the videos of the two twin tower buildings as they're collapsing. Uh, they basically are disassembling at the top and coming down. And one question I had at the time, but like everybody else, I, I, I was so befundled by it all, I bought into it for a little while. But why?
why when you have two 110 story tall buildings loaded with furniture, you know, desks, water coolers, bathrooms, etc., conference rooms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, why did you only have a rubble pile about five or six stories tall? Just because and the of the was deep, but it was only about three or four. Tim, Tim, we actually deep. calculated it out, and I calculated out the mass of the building and the debris pile. And we actually figured that one third of the mass was turned to an atomic vapor that actually blew away. Exactly. We know that the debris. We knew that the building was vaporized because we have six foot wide girders that are covered with two inches of high fiber asbestos. That even a blowtorch or a jet engine against the side of it wouldn't even melt the asbestos, let alone turn the the giant girders into an atomic vapor. So it had to hit 50 to 100 thousand degrees for milliseconds in order to do that. And the only thing that can do that is nukes. Not RDX, not high explosive cord, nothing. And certainly not thermic. So the so-called physicist, uh, Dr. Jones, was an idiot. I worked out, in fact, he calculated out the terajoules necessary of energy transfer to cause this to happen. I present almost 40 anomalies that proved it was nuclear activity. And I had the actual data from the U.S. Geological Survey, and they tried to block me from even getting my video. So I had to threaten to sue the video company that was videotaping my presentations at the 2007 Vancouver 9-11 conference. So let's put it this way. If you out there uh, think you can challenge Dr. Deagle, come on into my cage match, and I'm going to beat the hell out of you because well, I'm sick and tired. I had a, uh, a video news block uh, before the current one I have, which is called Europe, Lord Sterling's uh, News yeah. Block Europe. And uh, at the time, and uh, some students in Hawaii came up with this idea, let's take some of the remaining steel and turn it into coins. Like in World War II, we had steel pennies, I think in 43 and 44, we were using the copper in the war. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. It didn't go anywhere. And I, I uh, did a little uh, play detective and contacted, uh, tracked him down, contacted the, uh, the the leading student and his dad and uh, spoke to them. And then I spoke to the congresswoman at the time. She's, she's since passed away, but uh, uh, in, in Hawaii and got her support. And she took it to the Secretary of the Treasury. I took it to the uh, to the press office, the White House, the Treasury's press office, several places. And I thought it was a great idea. Everybody could have a, a, a penny or something in their pocket that came from uh, the, the remaining steel. Right. And uh, But yet the idea didn't fly. And I really didn't understand why, because they were doing, you know, everything to, to uh, you know, didn't want to do war it. And, and everything. Well, there was evidence on the steel. That's why it was shipped to China. Uh, there was evidence on the steel of, of the nuclear uh, energy yeah, yeah, as yeah. well as uh, yeah, in some yeah, places yeah. they Tim, do you know what the, the actual nuclear change is called? A nuclear, uh, it's called a neutron flux that turns iron 58 to iron 59, which is a stable, non-radioactive isotope that can be picked up by nuclear plasma spectroscopy. And if iron 59 is present, it's only present, like xenon 139, it's only present if there was a nuclear explosion. I didn't want you to have any coins made of steel because if there was a neutron right. flux and you detect even picograms of iron 59, it meant a nuclear explosion.